Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Jay Agner. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the hunt for Bigfoot. Obviously, not the real Bigfoot. Uh, we're going to talk about fully automated test processes. Uh, and spoiler alert, they do not typically exist. A um, little bit about me. I'm CEO of a company called JDAQA Software Testing. Uh, we're a software testing agency for small to medium-sized businesses. Been doing QA for like 10 plus years. Uh, I'm a tools nerd. I just love like very niche or applicable tools in any space, uh, which is probably how I ended up here uh, working with practice test. Um, tons of experience across you know a bunch of different uh, verticals and platforms, ecosystems, et cetera. And then I've worked in dev, quality assurance and product management. So uh, I've got a pretty you know well-rounded background when it comes to, to handling uh, quality of a product. So um, what are we talking about? Um, so the myth of full automation, you know, when to use automation, when not to, the tools of the trade, talking about the humans and how they really kind of fit into the puzzle and then maximizing your team strength. And then obviously what's next for QA. So the myth of few, uh, full automation, uh, 1967, uh, Northern California, uh, Robert Patterson, uh, and, uh, Roger Gimlin, uh, they captured what they claim to be Bigfoot on film. Everybody's seen it. I think it was the first, uh, picture on my slide deck there grainy kind of blurry picture off in the woods. And I always use that example um, as when people say, you know, they've seen a fully tested, uh, fully automated test setup, right? I, I don't think it exists. It's just a blurry picture off in the woods somewhere. There's some people that are involved somewhere in that process uh, that are probably not getting the credit they need to. And that's not to say automation is bad or that I don't believe in it because we do it all day, every day. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that there's some limitations and that manual testing is not going anywhere anytime soon. So why can't we just automate everything? Um, you know, I was looking for a good example and the, the Boeing 737 MAX is a commercial airplane. It was Boeing's flagship um, plane that they put out, latest software, latest hardware, you know, the latest and greatest everything, right? Um, two of them crashed, one in 2018, one in 2019. They could not figure out why these planes were crashing and why the pilots couldn't handle what was going on. Um, there was one faulty sensor. There was one sensor that was uh, sending erroneous data back to uh, the, the rest of the system, which would cause the plane to nose down to try to get out of a stall. The pilots weren't aware of that. It sent them into a tailspin and, you know, 346 people lost their lives. It's a very extreme example of, you know, why automated tests and simulations and all these things are fantastic. But, you know, there's always going to be the need for manual people to go in there and say, well, what if the sensor wasn't working, right? Or what if, what if the pilot thing happened to them, right? And, and removing that human element too much uh, can really lead to some catastrophic things. And obviously it's not as life or death all the time, but when things are, you know, involve safety or financial stuff or healthcare or whatever, it is very important to make sure you have that human element there um, to kind of make sure that the automation is doing the things it needs to be doing, but we're also using our critical thinking and intuition uh, that humans have, uh, at least for now, over top of the computer, right? So um, things are getting more complex, right? It's, it's another reason why we can't just automate everything. There's web stuff, API, you know, uh, mobile, cloud, you know, databases, everything kind of talking uh, together. And you just think about, you know, a website from 15, 20 years ago, or, you know, 10, 15 years ago to today, these very complex, you know, uh, web applications that do a million different things. Um, 15 to 50 errors are put in every thousand lines of code. And there's millions of lines of code that go into a lot of these platforms, right? So uh, developing automated systems for these things are sometimes just, too, compl you know, too complicated, right? It's, you have to do things manually sometimes because building the infrastructure to test everything automatically uh, just isn't feasible a lot of times with the complexity of these applications. Um, AI and ML, obviously that's the, you know, the topic du jour all the time, you know, everybody's talking about it. Um, but today, you know, if you put in out of sample data, which means data you didn't use to train the thing, there's still 20% error. I mean, we've all used chat GPT and probably seen some you know, uh, less than desirable results that come out of there. So that's not the answer today to just like stick this, you know, AI ML thing on top of testing and, and hope that it catches everything, right? Um, a little side note here, uh, test engineer time. So, so automation engineer time is about half of that is spent on maintaining the existing tests that you've written. This kind of brings me to a point where, you know, automated testing doesn't make sense until you get to a certain point in a product's life cycle, right? Like very early on MVP stage, you may even not, not even need really fully fleshed out QA at that point, 
But as you grow and as the product becomes more stable, um, then automation kind of makes more and more sense, right? But early on, if you're in a, a a growth phase of your company, or if you know you're you're just trying to get stuff out as quickly as possible to to get customers early on, um, that test engineer time that's being spent creating, maintaining, you know, troubleshooting all these automated tests, maybe better off just spent validating that things aren't getting out to production manually for now, right? There's there's a lot of times uh, automation just comes in too early and it, it bogs down the system. Um, this is. Uh, <laughs> very extreme stat, but I, I do think there's some some truth to it. Uh, one study I was looking at said 100 times the expense for fixing a bug in in uh, you know design phase versus maintenance, right? Which means if a, a QA engineer is brought in early on, they can say, hey, remember that button that you guys added? You're about to add a, a similar one and it caused all these issues down the line. Well, not only does it fix the issue there, but you have to think from design to product requirements, to development, to being QA, to release to production, to being in the customer's hands, you're getting in front of all that stuff. Uh, and you're getting in a lot of feedback early on, which is why I always suggest bringing those people further and further up the chain um, when it comes to including testing teams into your development phase, right? You want them in design, you want them in product, you want them wherever you can get them um, to try to bring that expertise they have for testing your platform. Um, Usability testing, 20, 30% of the time, um, you know, usability testing is a human thing, I think, for the most part, right? It's it's how do we use the thing? How do the how do groups of people use these things? How do, um, you know, how is it supposed to function when a human has it in their hands? It's hard to really automate all the different things that somebody else is going to do, which is similar to kind of an exploratory testing reason why you wouldn't want to use automated testing. But, um, you know, 50%, 50 to 100% build time increase, another kind of technical reason why you wouldn't want to put automation in too early. It can slow you down, right? It does speed you up later, but it can slow you down maybe in critical times that you don't want to be slowed down, right? You need to get stuff out as quickly as possible. I think we all kind of know like that early stage of, of companies um, where you're just like churning and burning, getting as much stuff out to production as quickly as you can. Um, adding double the build time may be a really big deal, right? So it may not make sense to do it uh, that early in the pipeline. So when to automate, right? I've just listed off a bunch of reasons why you shouldn't automate. I, I'm a huge fan of automation. Uh, I just think it lives in a very specific time and a very specific uh, you know, set of circumstances and that's different for everybody. Um, but regression testing, right? Uh, how does the thing function from component to a component? A mature company that has you know a bunch of regression tests that they do manually is perfectly ripe for automation, right? Like very modular tests. I'm a big fan of creating modular automation tests. You can chain them all together. If so, certain ones break or they fail or need to be updated, the rest of the, the mechanism can still run. Um, so regression testing is a great place to automate. That's that's probably the first place we go to when we, we, we look to automate somebody's platform. Performance and load testing quite simply cannot be done manually for the most part. I mean, yes, there are some things you can do, but if you're gonna scale, you really want to scale out. Can a hundred thousand users come on this platform at the same time? Uh, unless you have a you know, nine hundred nine nine or nine nine thousand nine hundred nine nine friends that are going to come test it with you at the same time, uh, you need automation, right? You need to record the scenarios you want to go through. You need to scale those up and down based on expected user load and things like that. So uh, performance load testing are huge for automation. Smoke testing, um, you know, again, does the thing do what it's supposed to do? I'm going to talk a little bit this later, but you know. This is the key point here is no right uh, productions, no no right operations in production, right? So don't use automated tests in production that write data to your database. Like just don't do it. Uh, you know, if you or imagine you're a, a bank application and you have some smoke tests that, you know, create a new user or change some sort of data somewhere and that test goes off the rails, well, you've just ruined your production database, right? Which may be a really big deal to a lot of people. So non-write operations, so checking uptime or validating that some functionality from some of the features works properly is fine, right? But don't do anything that writes writes data to a database via automated tests in production. Uh, obviously, repeated execution, things that are uh, repetitious, things that you have to do over and over and over again, login, forgot password, user profile, you know, just the staples of any kind of application, you know, perfectly fine to use for automation. Now, should you automate automate them as soon as you built your MVP? Probably not. You should probably be a little more, you know, stable and things should change a little bit less. Um, but these are all really good areas and the areas you should be thinking about doing automation. Um, on the flip side of that, I mentioned earlier, exploratory testing. That is, you know, kind of 
it's somewhat ad hoc. It's somewhat structured, but it's it's how you know and it kind of goes with usability of testing a little bit. Um, how do users use the application? What are the different places I could break this thing? Automation really isn't good for that. It's not really predictive, right? You're gonna you're gonna automate a bunch of scenarios that you've already thought of that somebody else has already done or already you know you've seen them use the platform in a certain way. But but exp exploring and finding new edge cases that may be very prevalent in production or in your customers' hands. You're not going to find that with automation. You need that, to, you know, people with hands on keyboard, right? Operations and production. Like I said, uh, if you're going to do that, have a person do it, right? If you're going to do some spot checks for things that need to be tested in production, even if it's not super, um, you know, uh, convenient to do it at, at 12 o'clock at night when the bill goes out or something, it's still much safer and much less of a pain uh, to do it that way than to have some automated tests go crazy off in production. Um, One-off testing. So this one's a little specific, obviously, if you're you know, updating a, a make a big database update or something, you've got a subset of users that still need to use the platform, um, you know, you're going to want to develop a pretty robust one-off test that just may not be a great fit for automation. Now, if you do that same update twice a month, then maybe automating some of that stuff does make sense, right? But for pure one-off tests, um, you know, it's typically not worth scaling up the infrastructure to handle something like that. And then I mentioned it before, uh, early stage development, the further along the pipeline you are as far as a mature product, the more stable you are, the better place you you know are into automation. If you're early stage um, and you're doing MVP, you're just turning on stuff, you're changing stuff, you're gonna spend a lot of time reworking stuff, rewriting stuff, troubleshooting automation, when in reality, like your biggest bang for your buck is just get this thing out to production in a working quality state. And that typically means having you know people's hands on it. So, um, Tools of the trade, there's a billion, and again, I'm like I said, I'm a tools nerd, so this is kind of like my favorite area to play in. Um, for most applications, and I'm gonna make a very broad statement here. For, may, for most applications, a SaaS-based web automation tool, if you have a web app, uh, is probably the place to start, and it's probably fine for a lot of stuff you need to do, right? You, you, very rarely do we run across in our business somebody who's doing something just so different that it won't fit any automated testing tool we used previously, right? So Ghost Inspector, Functionize, Reflect, Mook Test, uh, those are all kind of SaaS-based, record and playback, you know, insert some JavaScript if you need to grab some things specifically, but more kind of a, a abstracted testing tool for front-end automation. Browser Stack, a little more bring your own tests uh, into it and then run those across a bunch of different platforms and devices, um, but still kind of that SaaS model. Code driven is very important too, right? Google uses Selenium all day, every day still, and they probably have plenty of opportunity to use SaaS if they wanted to, but it's very flexible. If you need things that are, you know, if you need to get technical, if there's some really complex things you're doing, if you, you know, got some front end and back end things, um, you're, 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 we want to validate some really specific things with within your, your code or your CSS or uh, you know, even some API stuff. Selenium, Playwright, Cypress, Phantom CSS, I think are all really great tools um, to get that done. And again, it's just based on complexity, right? Like if you, have a platform where you can use a SaaS based automation tool that's secure and you can schedule stuff and it's quick to set up tests and tear them down. You can spin up environments and do a bunch of things. Just use them, right? They're the things that you, they're the, they're the easy kind of hop in the car and go mechanism for testing as compared to code driven uh, where you're going to have to spend some more time spinning up a framework, doing something custom. Uh, and then again, every time those things change, anything changes in the platform, you have to go in and hand, you know, right and hand change, um, anything that that's code written. So be smart about when you use SAS versus stuff versus code driven stuff, um, because they both kind of have their place. Uh, mobile automation tools, I think is an extremely underserved, uh, market when it comes to, you know, uh, testing things in, in production. Um, there's not really a ton of great record and playback. There are some, um, that match the web-based you know, record and playback functionality just because of the way mobile is designed and the way you have to run it and the way you can grab elements and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's a little more hands-on to do mobile automation, but, you know, we work with clients that have 100,000 users on them and we push out builds, you know, once a day, right? So in those situations, uh, autom writing automated tests in Appium or in Detox or Robotium, any of these things, it makes sense for us because it'll save us time on the back end. Um, instead of trying to you know keep up with the daily build cadence, you get out there, you put some automated tests for your most popular things and you're good to go, right? Uh, API automation. Um, I am very much of the mindset that a lot of API functionality can be validated the same time you're doing front-end automation or front-end validation. So, you know, 
your APIs are called for everything for the most part, right? If you have an API based platform. So login, you know, forgot password, all these things I talked about earlier, um, just rendering the screen, lots of different things uh, from an API perspective. Now, there are certainly things you can't test with that, right? You can't test specific payloads and you can't test, you know, uh, some security stuff and, and responses and things like that, um, which is where Postman, SOAP UI, rest assured, uh, Karate and Apogee come in. Uh, JMeter and BlazeMeter, you know, uh, again, very direct API testing if you need to get to that level. And BlazeMeter is a little more for performance testing as well. But, um, you know, there are certainly situations and times where you got to get in there, understand what your API is doing from uh, a QA perspective, and get in there and Postman, you know, you write some responses, uh, write some requests and responses, kind of validate that the, the, under the hood, the thing's supposed to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, but again, I would say for the most part, a lot of that functionality can be kind of dual tested if you're doing front end automation work or front end manual testing, uh, instead of just building out this massive suite of API tests that you may or may not, you know, get a benefit out of. Uh, manual testing tools. So practice test. That's why I'm here today. Uh, I love practice test. It's a uh, kind of a central hub for a bunch of these other tools. Um, you know, I think you know maybe a super early stage company doesn't quite know how to use practice test, but that real mid market, you know, into enterprise, uh, I think it really starts to make sense to have a general place where everything can kind of be funneled into. Um, you know, you can check your data, you can check your results, and I'll talk a little bit about results later. But um, you know. Test Rail, QA Deputy, Testmo, X-Ray, Zephyr, those are all test case management, you know, tools to some degree. Most of them hook into uh, your build pipeline. They hook into, um, uh, you know, your, your JIRA system. Um, so you can kind of understand where you are at any given time uh, just by looking at one of these tools. Um, so manual testing tools are important. I think they get swept under the rug a lot, um, but, you know, there's certainly a lot of value in being able to, uh, you know, have proper, clear, concise, re repeatable test cases in a repository. Um, and the biggest bang for the buck is that reporting that I mentioned a second ago. Reporting is paramount, right? And I think it's the main benefit of all these tools. Um, you want to be able to see, um, you know, if two weeks ago this module was working, but now it doesn't, you should have some traceability via these tools or just via any tool that shows you your test run history um, when something broke. Right. Maybe Jim over in development changed the library out and now login doesn't work. Right. And you're like, well, what happened? But at least having that traceability to say, number one, it was working two weeks ago and something between now and then broke it. Um, it's a it's a it sounds simple, but the, it's a big thing that a lot of companies don't have is that ability to trace back when things are working uh, and when they broke. Right. And that helps development. That helps product. It helps QA. It helps everybody just to have that traceability. So manual testing tools, I, I don't think get their they do a lot. They're just kind of like this tool that the QA team picks and kind of uses. And some people know about it and other people in the company don't even know it exists, but I think it's a, it's a pretty important part um, of, of the testing process. So the human element, I talked about it a lot already, but um, critical thinking, you know, exploratory testing, the, the trends in testing and how we're doing different things. Like we test things completely different than we did 10 years ago or 20 years ago for, for certain things. And um, we have tools that you know, we, we need to stay on top of as far as the trends go. Um, you can learn from your outcomes as a human being. Yes, AI can do that. AI can do a lot of these things, right? But in reality, we're not there yet. Um, the critical thinking and the continuous improvement, intuition, these are all kind of human things that, uh, you know, if you just go in there and you try to automate everything and you go, well, why does our build quality suck? Why does our product quality suck? It's because you're missing the critical thinking, intuition, continuous improvement, and you know, you're not checking for unexpected user behavior. Um, which, you know, is a hallmark, I think, of manual testing, right? Like I did these weird things and I made it break, right? Like it's just, it's almost what you think of a tester from 10 to 15 years ago, just kind of bang on the keyboard trying to, to break things. But in reality, those negative test cases are huge. Like finding out something's broken, uh, finding out what steps are to reproduce that thing, and then being able to explain that in a way to the development team, they can fix it. It, it is a big deal, right? And especially for things, like I mentioned, the 737 incident, um, you know, having that information documented and being handed off to a developer to fix beforehand would have saved a lot of time and money and lives. Right? It's, it's a big deal depending on what industry, industry you're in. Um, and, and interpreting results, right? Again, we can write all these tests. We can run all these tests. Uh, you know, automation can be included in some of these things, but interpreting the data we get back to really understand, um, you know, when something broke, 
uh, which of the areas of the platform aren't really as strong or as rigid as they need to be. Um, it's all kind of a human thing, right? We're not to the point, I don't know when we would be to the point where, you know, somebody other than a human being can sit down, see the results of the past, you know, two months of development and really understand how the quality of the product has gone up and down and correlate those to different things that have happened in the process, right? So I don't think that we're going to be taking humans out of QA at any certain point. Um, so maximizing your test team. This is maximizing any team, right? I mean, skill assessment, cross-functional collaboration, uh, understanding who the team you have is, right? So team dynamics are, are huge, especially for QA. Um, and maybe they change, right? Maybe you bring somebody in for manual testing, you realize, man, this guy's really technical and he's interested in learning about, you know, how to do automation, then, you know, that's somebody you need to pay attention to and realize that their, their skills are maybe different than you thought they were. Um, and that may be a really good person to interact with development, right? Because they kind of have that technical background. They can, they can speak the same language a little bit. Um, training and development, always learning, you know, always trying to, you know, when people work for us at, at our company, um, I'm not necessarily training them to be better or like teaching them things to always apply at our company, right? Like I want people to um, be able to take the experience they had with us and like do better things, right? Like do better with us, do better, you know, down the line, whatever it is, um, but train and develop your testing team in a way that number one makes them, you know, kind of feel like you care about their, their knowledge and, and they're bringing more to the table than just, you know, hitting buttons. Um, but but that they can really kind of get the next level of of career path um, from this continuous learning that that you've kind of enabled for them. Um, process optimization, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, things you can do as far as like managing your uh, agile flow with the team, but you own a certain part of it, right? Like you need to be part of the um, all, all the meetings and the ceremonies and everything else for agile. Um, really kind of just trying to drive home the fact that QA is an integral part of that. And it'll be different. It can You can fit in different parts in the Agile process, uh, you know, from the QA team, right? Uh, quality advocacy is another kind of staple of what we do. Um, we want the people and you should want the people in your testing team that are going to be the advocates, right? Like you are the last line of defense as a QA engineer. You are the guy that's going to get yelled at, you're going to not really get the credit for everything being great, but uh, you got to be an advocate and raise your hand up, even when it's scary to do so, um, you know, because you're telling somebody something they did was wrong. Right. But I think having the people and having the culture of people who are willing to stand up and do that is a really big deal. Um, kind of along the lines of skill assessment, tool specialization and partner collaboration. Uh, you want to stay up with the latest tools. And I mentioned some of the tools here, there's new tools every day in QA. Again, I think it's a, it's a weirdly underserved space. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of players in it, but there's like enterprise and then there's kind of just like everybody else. Um, so I think staying up to date with the latest tools, teaching your team how to use them, giving them the time and the resources to, to spend the time to know these tools. So when they go to use them for your product or somebody else's um, and they do well, I think is, is a really big deal. Again, generic kind of team thing is acknowledged contributions and healthy work environment. But, you know, again, QA is not a sexy job right? QA is not a, you don't always get a pat on the back for doing QA. You're usually getting yelled at for not getting the things done properly, right? So uh, every win has to be a big win. you got to have a healthy work environment where they feel like they can stand up and be the advocate for quality, right? Because if you don't have that, stuff's going to get out to production, you know, people are going to point fingers and nobody's going to really have that collaborative teamwork that you need because you're not promoting that healthy work environment for your QA team. Um, metrics and feedback, you know, kind of self-explanatory process performance stuff. You really want to understand who's doing great, who needs help, who needs more, you know, uh, uh, training, who needs, you know, a hand when they, you know, are working on something that's new to them. And, and those feedback loops, right? You want to be able to hear from your team. You're going to want them to be able to come to you and say, hey, man, uh, that release that went out and that thing that was broken, you know, I missed that, right? And like, just being able for them to tell you that and then you be able to tell them like, Hey, that's no big deal. We all miss stuff. Like, here's how we're going to fix it going forward. I think it's a really part, a big part of maximizing any team, you know, especially your, your QA team who's kind of under the gun a lot of the times. Um, so what's next for QA? I'm here to tell you, let's get it out of the way, right? AI. So everybody wants to talk about it. Uh, I think there's three kind of key areas, predictive analytics. So, uh, you know, predicting when things are going to break is going to be huge for, for the QA. 
Um, and I think we'll find a way to kind of work with those tools to really get ahead of some of these problems and figure out how to make sure the development team is aware of them, they can fix them, that sort of thing. Um, test case generation kind of in an intelligent way, I think is a big deal. Um, I think the ability to, uh, you know, AI tools are just going to augment what we do, especially for the, you know, near to midterm profit. Like we're just going to, yes, they can create things and do whatever, but the real power is using them as a tool, right? So creating test cases intelligently in a way that you can work with a human to, to make sure that they're right and that they're uh, saving time and, and using AI for what it's supposed to be. Uh, I think AI test case generation is, is definitely coming sooner than later. Um, similar to uh, predictive uh, analytics, but um, advanced anomaly detection uh, is basically, you know, in production, something goes wrong and, you know, using AI to help not only identify where that broke, but also identify, uh, you know, some areas that the developers need to check, um, you know, when they go through and, and, and fix the issue. Um, so the future of QA, right? Uh, it's a bunch of different areas. DevOps convergence is basically, uh, you know, everything that, you know, uh, we do from an automation side, we try to tie back into DevOps, right? So DevOps, the deployment infrastructure, uh, you know, running the automated tests, getting the builds out, that sort of thing. I think as we move forward, um, we're going to just see more and more integrations, um, you know, and, and ways to test things while deploying or during deploy, you know, a bunch of different uh, DevOps kind of uh, tie in QA that don't exist today. Um, IoT and big data, I, you know, I've worked in IoT for a long time and I can tell you it still feels like the Wild West. There's a bunch of different protocols and frequencies and it's it's still just kind of figuring out how do we test this kind of new connected world that we're in, even though it's been around for a while. Um, and big data, like big data is not going anywhere, right? So we're continuing to find new ways to test massive data sets, right? If you're Netflix and you're, um, you know, you're taking in data from millions and millions of data points, if you need that data to make decisions or to make changes in the platform or get feedback or even, you know, just very basic things, just being able to handle that big data as it goes in and comes out is going to be a big deal for QA. Um, the skills evolution, we talked a little bit about in AI, I think upskilling for, for what QA is going to be, you know, how to use these AI tools um, is going to be a big deal. Um, continuing to get more technical, you know, as, as QA as a profession and a career, I think, goes forward, I think being more technical is a good thing to, to have in there. Um, but that goes back to soft skill enhancement, right? So when I was cutting my teeth in QA, it was very much a us versus them, right? Like QA sat on this side of the wall, literally, and dev sat on this side of the wall. And like you were, if you were reporting a bug, you were basically saying that guy's code sucks and like he's an awful person and he should quit his job, right? Like, I mean, that's how it seemed when you would report a bug to somebody. So it was, a, there's a big evolution, I think over the last, you know, decade or two about um, how developers perceive QA, which has, I think, gotten extremely, uh, you know, it's extremely more positive today than it was, you know, a long time ago. Um, but part of that is QA soft skills. We were, you know, just kind of a bunch of quiet nerds for the most part, sitting in the other room, just testing stuff. Now we're figuring out how do we interact with the rest of the team, right? How are we really communicating things? How are we advocates for quality? And those soft skills, um, you know, are really important. And I think that's continuing to see QA leadership in companies um, is going to be kind of the future uh, of how things go in companies. Because if you don't have somebody there being the champion of quality, uh, it's only a matter of time before, you know, your, your platform is called out for not being that great. Right. So um, risk-based testing, I think is something that's kind of continued to, to come along as far as process innovations go. Um, it's an organizational mindset where it's like, uh, you know, everybody kind of knows insurance risk and like, you know, how, how risky, you know, somebody is to drive your car or whatever. Um, that's how you determine your rate. Well, risk-based testing is kind of the same thing, but how do you decide what to test, right? Like, how do you decide which of these things is the most risky, which ones can we live with? Uh, and you know, which ones does, does not matter at all, right? So I think risk-based testing is going to continue to evolve because that includes people from the C-level down. Right. So typically a lot of times today, it's like product people, dev people, QA people, like this is the most risky stuff to test. But I think the real, you know, uh, mindset behind risk-based testing is like everybody in the organization is aware of QA, is aware of testing and is making sure these core components of the platform uh, are tested thoroughly before they go out the door instead of it just being a, a kind of a lower down the chain, uh, you know, mindset. Uh, a few more things, uh, quality engineering. So QA to QE, again, I think I spoke about that a little bit with the, the upskilling for modern QA and performance engineering. Um, 
both those things, you know, as things get more complex, we're going to need more complex and more technically savvy QA engineers. Um, you know, think about an app when the first iPhones came out versus the apps today, like just those stark differences between functionality and performance and, and, you know, just usability. Um, you're going to need some, some pretty in tune folks who understand technology, who understand the back end, who understand cloud and databases and API calls and all these different things. So I think you will see technical, you know, QA engineers uh, become more and more prevalent as we go, as opposed to kind of your generalist QA person who just kind of comes in and pushes the buttons and and kind of writes some bugs up. I think we're going to see more and more uh, of the technical folks, you know, uh, taking over in the next, you know, maybe five to ten years. Um, Intelligent automation platforms and custom tools. Um, you know, custom tools are never going to go away. Uh, they're always going to be, you know, very specific things that are needed. You know, uh, depending on your platform, it kind of goes back to the no code versus code automation, right? Like, no code automation is for you know, kind of generic, out of the box stuff that you can test. You know, with record and playback. Custom tool development is more of the code driven stuff. Like you need something very specific that doesn't exist today. Um, and then intelligent automation platforms, again, I talked about that a little bit earlier with um, intelligent test case creation um, and, and and figuring out how to get some context into our testing, right? Because I mentioned that a couple of times that that's the biggest holdup, I think, with manual versus automated testing is the, the context. Humans are great contextual beings, right? Like we understand why something broke today that was, you know, implemented two weeks ago because this guy changed something here and did this and did this. If we can get some of that in the automation tools, I think um, we'll start to see kind of an explosion of QA automation tools that that can grab pieces of information from different places, apply those, um, and kind of use them in an intelligent way. Uh, and the last thing, you know, we're, the COVID came, everybody went remote. A lot of people stayed that way. Distributed teams are not going away, but there is certainly a different vibe between sitting, you know, in cube doing in cube testing in someone's cube versus in cube testing versus in a virtual, you know, setting. So um, I think we're just going to continue to see that evolve. And I'm, I'm, you know, very interested to see how you know, more IoT things, are we sending devices to remote testers to test things and we connect them all together somewhere? Are we still requiring people be in an office for some of these things that just can't be tested remotely? Um, and those are all kind of things I think we'll figure out, um, you know, over the next few years, but it, it definitely feels like a big shift in that people who thought QA engineers had to be in the same building you know, uh, while the things were being built are realizing that just like everybody else, you know, you can work remotely doing QA and that's, you know, that's what we've done for years at our company. So, uh, you know, man is still the most extraordinary computer of all. Uh, I don't know if John F. Kennedy said that, but it was on somewhere that I found it. So if he didn't say that, please let me know. Uh, and if you have any questions, I think I'm, uh, a little short on time or, or ahead of time. So, uh, feel free to ask away. Thank, hi, Jay. Thanks so much. That was a great session. Um, unsurprisingly, we do have a couple of questions related to AI, considering sure. it's top of mind. <laughs> okay, sure. uh, great. So the first one is about bias in test data. And uh, the question is that because um, it's sort of an open secret that AI models can, can, can inherit biases present in trading data, and that may lead to skewed test scenarios and test results. I'll add my own comment on top of that you mentioned earlier about um, kind of pairing AI with human intelligence as well. So how do you feel about bias in test data? Wow. I'm not an AI uh, expert, but I can say that I think um, it would need to have the same rigors as biased in non-AI test data, right? Like we... Um, it's very easy to be, to put your blinders on as a human being and to kind of test things that you know work and like make sure things are good. But then something gets out to production and it explodes and then there's like a big problem because nobody thought kind of outside of that that box. So, I, you know, it's a very uh, generic answer, but I would say, um, you know, I think the risks are kind of the same and you have to know where your data is coming from and what you're using. I mean, we, you know, if we're going to test a FinTech application, and we're using spreadsheets that we're loading into some automation tool, those can be biased too, right? Like we could have picked the ones that we thought were going to work and we could have picked the ones that we know that had some problems. And like, you can, it's a, it goes into your overall testing strategy. I think that whatever data you're using, um, whatever, you know, uh, information you use to create your tests, 
it, you have to check for that bias beforehand. So hopefully that answers the question in, in a somewhat direct way. I think so. Okay. Um, the second question is about security risks. Um, I'll add my own comment on that as well. Since you mentioned fintech, um, finance, financial services, fintech um, as a whole, um, just like every other industry has its security protocols and, and fears over identity theft and, and private data. So the question is really about AI driven testing tools can become targets for exploitation. Um, how do you feel about that? What do you think we can do as testers and QA professionals to sort of mitigate that uh, or at least reduce that risk? Another great question. Um, yeah, I uh, I would say my answer is kind of similar to, it all goes to strategy, right? Like if, if you're going to pick an AI tool to use, you better know what's being used to feed it. You better gonna know what it's what's trained on, what the security limitations and implement, you know, uh, you know, uh shortcomings may be for that before you pick that one for your platform. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's kind of like you're gonna have that risk, period. You're gonna always have that risk, whether it's any tool. Um, but it's gotta be part of your due diligence. It's gotta be part of your tool selection process. Like what is the AI tool we're using? What's the model they're using to train it? What is the security? You know, what, what, you know, is there any, uh, are we feeding data into something that's going to be fed out to somebody else eventually like that sort of security I'm thinking too. So it's really planning and strategy. Uh, and I think it's the phase we're in, right? Like we don't know enough about these tools and the models and everything else to just like kind of blindly assume that they're going to work or be secure. So I think, you know, it kind of goes along with the, any new technology, you really got to dig in um, and understand what it is you're using before you use it. Okay. I, yeah, I hear that. That's a great answer. All right. Um, the floor is open, of course, to any other, any other questions anyone has. Feel free to ask now or you can send them later. And Jay, if we do get any questions later, happy to pass that along to you as well. Um, any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience today? I don't think so. Thank you for having me, though. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, keep your, keep your manual people working. Don't, uh, don't try to, you know, the computers have not taken over fully yet. So uh, I don't, I don't think for anybody who's concerned that we're going to lose jobs from testing, uh, don't be, we're, we'll, we'll be fine. Okay, great. Well, thanks Jay for a, a great session. Um, it's been great having you today. Um, Thank you.